new year, new webinar series. I hope this time without uh, technical glitches. Uh, whoever joined our last webinars uh, knows that uh, the technology sometimes, unfortunately, is is playing a trick with us. Uh, but we are we are hopefully getting better. And um, uh, this is our second um, interview format of our webinar series um, today with one of our portfolio funds. Um, with Maximilian Bade from Nucleus Capital and with our very own Alena Schollmeier from our investment team. Um, so my name is Stefan Heller. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the founding partners of AQVC. Uh, AQVC stands for Alpha Q Venture Capital. Um, me and my partners, we were founders and entrepreneurs and angel investors before. We realized angel investing is very, very hard to scale and a lot of work. And we had the dream of a product that allows us to invest into venture capital more scalable, where we get diversification out of the box. We have a semi-liquid product and we get exposure, especially to early stage VC funds that are either hard to access and oversubscribe. And on the other hand, emerging managers, where we really want to pick and select the best emerging managers like Nucleus Capital um, and have them in our portfolio. And that's what we have created over the last two years. We've invested into six funds last year. We are about to do four more funds this quarter. So extremely busy period. Um, so even better that we take the time to tell you a little bit more about our investment strategy and interview Nucleus and Max, how it's going for him and what his sort of plan is for 2023. Um, before we go to that, um, maybe handing over quickly to Alena. Do you also want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, very happy to have you all. Uh, good to be part of this very first session of 2023 um, and especially happy to host Max because as probably many of you know, I, I looked a lot into climate tech last year, um, trying to get a good overview over the European market um, and maybe adding a few more words to our investment strategy here. So as Stefan already mentioned, we not only look at very established funds globally, but also at the best emerging managers coming out of the ecosystem that can be really first-time investors, first-time setups, such as uh, Nucleus with Max and Isabella, or more kind of established emerging managers, so to say, that maybe come out of, of existing VCs. But um, very happy to also give you a bit of background on, on the um, yeah history and story of Max and Bella there. I think that's quite interesting. Um, I myself, as Stefan mentioned, take care of uh, all these inbound funds uh, at AQVC. So um, whoever is interested to get in touch with us, um, I'm the right one you, you should shoot a message to. But I think enough talking about AQVC. Um, Max, very happy to have you. And maybe we start off with a quick intro. Of course, we prepared a few questions, but also to the audience. If there is anything you're particularly interested in uh, regarding Max and and his fund, um, just use the chat function, and then we are happy to collect the questions and answer them in the end. Um, so over to you, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Lena and Stefan. I'm glad that so many people are joining, and I hope this is going to be a very interesting and uh, also fun session. And um, as Elena mentioned, my name is Max. Um, together with my partner Isabella, I run Nucleus Capital, which is a brand new um, emerging fund um, focused uh, entirely on supporting on purpose-driven entrepreneurs um, that are addressing some of the systemic issues um, that we're currently facing uh, in the world. And with that, we're specifically focused on three subsectors. One of them is food technology, one of them is industry decarbonization, and the last one is uh, a term that we coined uh, programming biology which kind of entails synthetic biology, but also tech bio, so the intersection of software and, and biology. Um, quick background on myself. So I've spent uh, my entire young career in the startup ecosystem, um, maybe naively never set a foot in, in a corporate, uh, but also until now uh, have never had the urge to do so. Um, have fair, fair share of operational experience, I'd say, um, starting my own company, then being a, uh, head of business development at another venture-backed startup and eventually joined the investing side, uh, most recently with uh, Atlantic Labs or Food Labs. Um, and then in 2020, or roughly two and a half years ago, uh, embarked on this journey that is now becoming ever more nucleus capital. And uh, yeah, I would never look back. Uh, <laughs> uh, super pumped uh, to be here and super excited um, that what we have uh, started is, is growing stronger and stronger. 
Thanks, Max. Yeah, um, super excited also to be a to be a part of that. Yeah, we we backed Nucleus Capital as one of our first uh, two investments, I believe. I think you were actually our second investment. Um, so um, we've looked at back then. We've looked at over fifty emerging managers, and then um, got very excited to work with you and to partner with you. Um, so um, that was. That was very early in our journey, and uh, right now we can already see the portfolio developing, and uh, it, I think it was the right choice. Um, so maybe you can tell, tell a little these, bit about don't your... Don't tell me these, these numbers. They, they increase the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but before we go into maybe your portfolio and also what you're doing, um, you know, you mentioned you never worked at a corporate, right? What is exciting uh, to you in, in venture and, and in the startups? What excites you? And I honestly think it's the fast pace of the industry. And it's this um, humbling experience of working with people who are really trying to be at the utmost edges of technology entrepreneurship. And this, you know, intrinsic motivation to move something forward in the world, be it, you know, in terms of climate impact, but also be it in terms of just starting something from nothing and enjoying the ride and the process along. And I think this is particularly something that I have learned ever since starting Nucleus. Um, is, you know, being in the shoe of a founder because, you know, an emerging manager effectively is a founder as well. It's just uh, in a different industry and with a different product. Um, and that has helped me a great deal of building up empathy um, even more uh, for founders that we work with and invest in. Mm. Alida, mm -hmm. what is it for you? <laughs> Definitely also the fast pace, but I think also having the opportunity to working with like so many very um yeah experienced people but also people just joining the ecosystem super freshly being hungry learning from them and i think the very open um mindset in general that everyone wants to learn from everyone and i think there are no clear rules in venture capital and in in the startup ecosystem right so everyone has to get their their bits and pieces together by themselves um and i i like that it's it's a constant challenge but a very nice one yeah. um but Max, actually looking also at a at building up a, a new emerging venture capital brand um of course it's it's all fun and games on the one hand side but i think there are also many challenges to it so why did you decide to to come out with your very own venture capital fund dead early on in your career uh, it's a very good question um uh, to be fair, I've I've always known that I wanted to end up in this industry. So uh, it's uh, quite funny to look back now. It's been 10 years since I had my first experience uh, in venture, which was one of my first internships. Um, at the time, at a small fund, very similar to, to where Nucleus is, is right now. Um, and ever since then, I kind of caught the bug, right? So I knew I uh, had a couple of like experiences um, that I needed to gain to eventually be in a position to actually work with founders and help founders. And so that has just taken uh, some time. But uh, from a passion and and um, kind of interest perspective, I've always known that uh, I want to work in this industry. And I've always been an entrepreneurial spirit. So it was just a matter of time until I kind of reached my ceiling in either an existing firm or um, kind of wanted to have um, see my own ideas uh, come to life. Yeah, I, I I think it's what you also mentioned earlier, right? Starting a VC fund is is a very entrepreneurial journey, right? People don't see that sometimes from the outside how how hard the the road is, yeah. Um, but any fund manager we talk to, even like some of the now bigger names we have in in Europe and and Germany, a lot of them talk like can talk for hours about war stories from their fund one, yeah. So and I think this is. You know, this is very, very hard to go down the route of building a VC fund. And for us, when we started AQVC, me and my partners, we, we have co-invested as angels for many years. And we've been very active angel investors. And we were at this crossroad of saying, look, do we build another VC fund? Or do we technically build a fintech, right? I, I still see us as a sort of fintech to build something that is a little bit uh, different. Um, because we saw there are so many great VC funds out there that we want to partner with. Um, and so that's what like what is exciting to us that this the scene is like it feels like the startup ecosystem 12, 15 years ago when I started as a founder, where I went to meetups on, on in London, where really, you know, Silicon Roundabout and some of these guys that were really like sharing and mentoring uh founders of how to build companies. And now it feels like the same is happening for VC, where you have so many emerging managers 
who are extremely passionate about certain problems around certain areas um, and are really trying to to change the ecosystem. So that's really exciting to me. Adding adding one point here, I think also having the developments that that trends are not hypes anymore. They're really like long standing trends, and I, I think. Max, that's also one topic that motivated you identifying or starting in, in like more of the food tech related topics and then adding more and more impact relating um, yeah, subjects to, to the thesis. Maybe here jumping in a bit on, on what Nucleus actually does and maybe we can also go into one or two examples of the portfolio. Like what made you build such a strong thesis around all these impact driven topics and also from 2020 onwards, I think there were so many climate tech funds uh, being started in Europe, especially. How do you differentiate from them? And maybe how did your thesis like also evolve over the time? That's a very good question. And just, do you see my screen? Does that work? Yes, perfectly in full screen. Perfect, amazing. So um, I think it might, might make sense to, to quickly use some, some visual aid um, and for this part of the discussion. And just very briefly, because before I begin answering your question, um, one point I wanted to add, Stefan, um, particularly about the challenges of starting a fund and being an emerging manager. Um, I believe that fundamentally the entry barriers are still very high, right? So um, when I started, and I'm very happy to talk maybe for 30 seconds about the journey as well, because um, I think it, it gives uh, some context. Um, I also began angel investing, uh, never having had uh, a lot of money. I very quickly ran out of money and then I learned that there's a way to syndicate deals um, using a very manual process of trust agreements. And I kind of came together with my friends and family and also broader network and um, to start kind of um, allowing uh, or democratizing, if you will, access um, to, to that asset class as well. So I fully understand where you guys are coming from and I admire that as well. Um, with very tiny tickets, um, eventually, you know, gathering together 2,500 euros a year and 3,000 euros a year um, to get uh, to a point where we can actually uh, invest in a company and be allowed on a cap table. And from there on, um, I kind of started building uh, a little bit of a track record, right? And with that in mind, demonstrating that you can actually, or that I am able to access good deals and build a deal flow. We started uh, this journey uh, on, on more like professionalizing, institutionalizing our activities, um, and the big, big um, naivete that I had when I when I set up Nucleus was was obviously that I only knew the front end, if you will, of the venture investing job. Right, so I spent three years in a venture fund. I learned how the deal life cycle works, how to you know negotiate and how to win deals and so on and so forth. But I've never seen the back end of the job, which is like setting up the fund, thinking through portfolio construction thinking through all the legals that are involved, right? So I always uh, jokingly say uh, to my fiance that I've done like half a legal degree in the last uh, two years. Um, and so when I started the journey, I wasn't aware that that's, you know, 80, like I say, I'd say 70% of the difficulty in setting up the fund is actually from a structural perspective and from a, from a, from a portfolio construction perspective, right? And so um, on that end, uh, looking back two and a half years, uh, I had no idea what I was going to get in myself into. Um, and that is definitely still a, a big barrier to entry. And at the same time, and this is also something many founders sometimes aren't aware of, uh, it's the fact that uh, we ourselves as GPs, especially the founding GPs, always have to contribute uh, quite a bit of personal private capital um, to these funds, right? So we're not just, we are managing other people's money, but we also have skin in the game, right? And I think as a young uh, kind of uh, venture entrepreneur like myself, um, I don't have that kind of money, right? And so you need to get a credit line. You need to be, uh, you know, all in, if you will. And, and that's also part of why I think this is, uh, of course, it has to work and why it will work. Um, so it's incentive alignment as well at some point. But uh, it's a high barrier to entry um, in the end, and that's uh, very difficult. And um, now coming briefly to, to how we see ourselves and how we differentiate ourselves from uh, potentially or like from holistic climate funds. Um, as I mentioned very early in the in the discussion, we're kind of like a more sector-focused approach um, where we try to differentiate ourselves um, specifically by being able to go very deep in food technology, to go very deep in uh, what we call programming biology, which is for us an, an enabling layer. And our thesis um, predominantly is not um, that we're like positioning ourselves as an impact fund much rather we are a technology investor um, that is uh, following a thesis of uh, rebuilding our global economy with the green DNA. And let me dive a little bit deeper on what that means. For us, 
um, climate change is obviously real and the impact that technology can have is obviously something that we're all aligned on. Um, but we don't think that um, you know, impact investing per se is, uh, is, is, is the right approach for us. We really think that, or we fundamentally believe that um, the economy will need to be rebuilt um, with biological tools, with um, a green DNA, and that's going to be a competitive advantage or disadvantage for companies. And as a logical consequence of potentially having a competitive disadvantage, we will see that big businesses are going to um, start adhering to the climate goals that we set. And we're going to see that um, these companies will start to make a change because their product offerings and the end consumer mindset and the regulatory hurdles um, or the regulatory pressure that's coming down is going to drive these um, decisions. And effectively, this means um, it's a climate like reversing the adverse effects of climate change or um, mitigating climate change is going to be a logical consequence of economically triggered um, competitiveness within our global economy. And this is like where we are coming from, right? So we want to invest in companies uh, very early on and technologies very early on that um, enable industry uh, to adhere to these impact goals. Um, and effectively, we do this in these three sectors. Maybe one other thing that I think is, is very interesting to mention um, just right now, um, and this also kind of ties into um, our plans for 2023, right? Um, we're definitely going to set up our second uh, fund, uh, our second vintage, uh, which is going to be started in January 2024. And I think um, we are lucky in, in that we uh, can leverage perfect market timing, both on you know the technology adoption in terms of where key enabling technologies lie on the market readiness, technology readiness, and also cost competitive curve. But on the other hand, also uh, in terms of where, when we look at the industry as a whole, um, our investment period will fall most likely in a period of um, you know a, a correction cycle and where a lot of like financial discipline is going to be back installed back into the industry both for investors as well as founders and we can benefit a little bit from lower valuations and um, not so much for us because we're mostly pre-seed and seed investors and um, but effectively this means uh, we're going to start investing in a time when the market is slowly to uh, slowly going to pick up again and we'll divest in a, in a time of the market um, with increased M&A activity and IPO activity, um, because that's just going to be the, the following up market cycle. Maybe, Max, very, very cool that you already met Nucleus too. Of course, the whole AQBC team is <laughs> very hyped uh, for the next fund generation to come and also kind of have you as the first emerging manager in our portfolio that, that comes into the second fund generation. I mean, not only you learn a lot, but we do as well. And I think we can both say that we learned a lot together. Um, but maybe talking a bit like also more more numbers and more on the organizational part, like how do you plan to to increase the fund and and what is um yeah what is the way on on taking that one more on the institutional side? And um, that's a very very good question. So um, our first uh, vehicle was a proof of concept, right? Effectively, very small size, um, around seven million in in, in AUM. Um, that had three goals. One of them was to prove that we can get access to great deals and that we can you know, attract deal flow in the first place. The second goal was that we can put together a team um, and develop a thesis and grow together as a team. And the third point was that we uh, have a steep learning curve in terms of you know, becoming investment managers and, and you know, learning the job on the go, so to speak. And I think we've proven um, that we have achieved all of these three goals. And with the second fund, uh, we're now really ready to step up in a very natural way, in a very natural um, evolution, if you will. And we are going to increase our, our size of the fund uh, significantly for us. So jumping from seven to 35 million is, is the target, it's the idea. Um, and that's mainly driven bottom up um, by some observations that we've had throughout our first 20 investments. Observation number one, and also key learning, uh, was that... Uh, Specifically in our area, uh, uh, on our sectors, and um, founders value our positioning and they also value our value add. And the unique selling proposition, if you will, of Nucleus um, is very much driven by our community DNA. And what I mean by this is that we have very strategically from day one um, tried to get a lot of like functional experts around our Nucleus 
um, who are all incentivized by carried interest. So for us, this is really a team sport. Uh, if Nucleus 1 or Nucleus 2 um, is going to be successful, it's not going to be because of me, or it's not going to be because of Isabella, but because a uh, collective uh, engagement from our community. And this means um, these functional experts uh, are being incentivized with our carried interests, so options, if you will. And uh, within our target sectors, um, there's very deep functional knowledge that is specific to these kind of sectors. Just to give you an example, in, in food technology, um, getting into the retail uh, shelves, like understanding how to position a brand, understanding how to talk to mass market consumers is um, a knowledge uh, is knowledge that uh, not everybody has, right? And so being able to talk to somebody who has been doing this for 20 or 30 years gives founders um, simply an edge in, in building their companies. And it increases the odds of kind of surviving the first 18 months to 24 months which are very rocky. And so for us, it's really about setting the, rare, the right or like putting the company on the right uh, direction, if you will, um, very, very early on from the very beginning. Um, um, and this is, uh, so, yeah, sorry. So Sorry, Max. Uh, I just wanted to cut yeah. in here because I think it's very interesting to some of the also emerging managers who've, who have joined us. Uh, we've seen this a couple of times that obviously you're incentivizing with Kerry, your mm -hmm. advisors. Um, what what are your best practices? And also what is what are maybe the, the things to avoid in setting up a structure like this? Yeah, I think, I mean, everybody knows these advisor slides, advisory board slides, also from pitch decks from founders, right? And many times, uh, I think a level of dilution of some advisors is is very high because they, they repeatedly show up on so many decks and you just question like, what's their involvement? What's their time commitment, right? So I think for us, it was always important. And I think this is still something that obviously we are trying to to figure out as we go, right? We think in a very um, product-oriented or productized way about our offering. And part of that offering is not only access to people who really have deep industry know-how, um, but it's also getting them committed to the fund. And with every advisor we have, we have contracts in place where we have, you know, for four years, these people have not only vesting uh, similar to a, to a company, but they also have very fixed amount of uh, hours that they spend with our portfolio companies or with us. And I think that's important. And here, um, the difficulty is obviously getting these people to commit contractually to saying, hey, I will spend, I don't know, 40 hours a year or like 80 hours a year um, on a particular topic with particular nucleus portfolio companies and do that exclusively, right? I think that's the challenge. And um, this is also something that we're still trying to, to figure out and, and, and try it to scale at some point, right? Yeah. Alena, what do you think from... Um, from our process, right? We've looked at 350 funds last year. I know we've had internal discussions around these setups, especially the the advisor slides. We've seen some decks with three or four slides sometimes of advisors. Like um, I always like in the past, it used to be the logo graveyard where people just put <laughs> tens and twenty and thirty logos of random companies where they had some form of engagement in the past, and now it feels like the the advisor slide graveyard where you have dozens of advisors and usually the advisors don't even know they're mentioned in the deck. Um. <laughs> yeah, actually you're right. And I think um, Max hit uh, the nail on the head. Um, it's all about getting them engaged and it's not about having 150 advisors. It's maybe only about having four or five or maybe 10 good ones that really support you. And um I'm, I'm now talking about the emerging managers side uh, because that's the ones we think and where we see that it works with a model of really incentivizing them, being honest and transparent about it. And I think also no good LP in a fund would complain about incentivizing advisors in, a, in such a way, like with a bit of carry or um, anything else kind of in a monetary way when they see the output of this. And also, I think that's a big part of our kind of criteria to assess these emerging managers, showing intellectual honesty and saying, hey, we're not yet good in everything and we can't cover all of the stuff we have to uh, when building up a fund. So it's totally fine to get expertise uh, inside. But I also really like the approach of doing that in a more exclusive way and not just like putting names and pictures out there. Yeah, absolutely. As a founder... Uh, when when I was building FinCom as an example, we talked back then to multiple funds, and I mean this was 2016, so a bit, you know, a couple of years ago, and um, and some of the funds they were offering then support, 
from some of their advisors. Sometimes they had like even marketing people or so, something like that. And they were negotiating that into the term sheet, charging it back to the startup in the form of a reduced valuation or an additional ticker for them. Yeah. Um, I've seen these, I've not seen these deals in a few years, right? I, I think they they moved away. It used to be like the rocket model in that sense, where rocket invested kind of 10 million and then you got a bill for 8 million for rocket services and rent and things like this. Yeah. So, um, but how do you see that? Is that still a thing or, or uh, is that really best, uh, worst practices these days, Max and Alena? Um, I mean, I'm not too much involved into other funds setup, so I wouldn't know exactly how, you know, compensation slash incentives uh, are aligned and how it works. What I think is, uh, I've heard of these kind of approaches and I, I, I think it's uh, it's obviously unfair to the founder and it doesn't really align anything. And um, what's important for us is, and I think this is also a critical piece of the equation to make this whole model work, is really um, to be able to, for the founder and the advisor to build a very trustful relationship. And this was one of our biggest learnings because in the past, um, we kind of did the investment and post-investment process at some point um, when the round was closed and so on and so forth. And we approached the founder and said, hey, you know, based on, on our due diligence, based on our feedback, based on our assessment, here's like two or three weak spots that we have identified. Uh, nevertheless, we invested because you're amazing and it's a great company, but we do believe that you could use some coaching uh, on these areas and we think, you know, we should join a workshop with one of our advisors who can help you here. And then it feels a little bit, um, I wouldn't say um, random, but it feels a little bit uh, uncomfortable for the founder if then some some silver uh, back uh, industry expert with 30 years comes into the room and kind of, you know, explains you how to do things. And uh, this has obviously created some friction in the past and uh, we have learned from this. And I think now we're like further productizing the way um, when we involve them and to give them enough time to also build a trustful relationship. And most of the time, and this is something that I think plays into our cards, um, is the fact that not only us as managers, but also our advisors are very aligned with our vision and very aligned with the vision of our founders. Because in the end, what we're trying to do is um, to build companies and to invest in technologies that have a net positive impact on the world. And I think this is um, very, very important. And it was also highlighted um, as one of the key reasons uh, how uh, founders choose their initial investors, right? Alignment of vision, alignment of purpose. And this is, yeah. is true for our advisors as well. And that's why we believe uh, that it works. I think it's true for the LP uh, uh, GP relationship too, right? At the end yeah. of the day, it's all about building trust and, and and building this relationship. And as you mentioned, right, you, you're moving from a 7 million fund to a 35 million fund. Yeah. Um, what is your sort of learnings going through that journey? I know you haven't officially started fundraising. It's still early days, but I mean, we know you've been in touch with multiple LPs. We, we, we've we tried to be helpful. You've shown uh, a great trust also where we have built a very good relationship. Um, what sort of your advice on that note? How do you build this relationship to LPs and then how you actually execute this to a bigger fund size? And it's a very good question. I mean, first of all, I have to say it's uh, it's really scary. <laughs> so the, the moment you start, um, you know, putting together your financial model and you, you start thinking about portfolio construction and how the strategy doesn't change um, with with that, you know, increase in fund size, um, which it doesn't, which is why we picked uh, the number not randomly, but we, you know, effectively modeled it out and it's, it's driven by bottom up uh, assumptions. And um, it's very scary to all of a sudden make that jump from initially investing, you know, 200K into a company to investing up to a million, right? So I think... That's part of our manager learning curve that we have to go through. And I'm very sure that our first two or three investments will feel um, yeah, a little bit uh, uncomfortable, but I think you get used to this uh, once we hit that, hit that scope. And I think most importantly, what will change, um, and this I think is a big challenge for any merger manager, is the kind of LP that we need and the kind of LP that uh, we can reach. Um, as you know, there is no uh, index out there that uh, you know allows us to to scrape um, or like not not even scrape, but to simply Google family offices and and, and investors and funds. So this is um, hard for us to do this LP discovery in the first place. And then second of all, um, it's also hard to find LPs who can invest slightly larger tickets because 
next to you in fund one we we of course were lucky um in that we got a couple of other institutional investors and also a family office but most of the money still came from individuals entrepreneurs um angels if you will and um the angels obviously will continue to play a very important role because uh, they are part of the ecosystem they help us with identifying investments and they have a great value add as well and that's what we want but uh, you know, 35 million uh, is, a, is a big number that I think I will not be able to raise only from 200K checks. And if so, then that's a very fragmented, uh, very tedious, very tiring fundraise. Uh, I'm very happy to do that. And it's, you know, that's my worst case scenario. And that's why I'm like two, two years in it and I'll, I'm sure I get it done. But uh, what we are really looking for is, is um, family offices um, who have a shared passion for what we do um, and also a vision alignment. And who are interested in in you know supporting uh, young people who are kind of like trying to shake up the industry a bit or or make their own path? And I would say if I'm an LP, I would totally fall in love with your investment strategy. Kind of looking at a barbell and having you know big established funds with like you know maybe slightly lower returns on a on a multiple on, on capital invested basis, but very um, safe safer returns in that regard. And and that and balancing that with, with new emerging managers. Who tend to be sector focused, who tend to be, you know, at, at investing in cutting edge companies, also stuff that's just more interesting, if I may say that. Yeah? I mean, uh, I just love the fact that we get to work with people who uh, work in biocomputing, who are, you know, building um, uh, space biotech productions where we, you know, develop materials and, and, and drugs uh, in microgravity and, you know, proverbial moonshots, if you will. Yeah? But I think. Higher returns always correlate with the higher willingness to take risks. And over time, my feeling of, of more maturing venture funds is the fact that obviously they found a model that works, and this is something we're still looking for. But um, you also kind of um, navigate towards uh, the mean, right? Both in terms of the risk you're willing to take and also in terms of the kind of companies you're, you're financing. And that will result in, in, in average market uh, returns, which is totally fine, right? Um, but for us, it's really about uh, trying to find uh, exciting companies, stuff that is unusual um, and prob probably also a bit rebellious. Very nice. And um, maybe a quick question to the audience uh, before we round it up. Um, is Are there any questions um, in the chat? You can either um, push them in the chat or maybe raise a hand and we quickly uh, take you up on the panel. Um, so in case anyone has outstanding questions now is the time um but in the meantime max, max maybe also one more question towards your organization uh we all know isabella and uh your partner in crime so to say but uh, with extending the fund size i guess you will be also like evolving on on, on this level um how are you planning to do that is that more of a slowly but surely process or are you actively looking for people to join the team so what, what is the um, state in preparations for the fundraise we we of course um have spent many hours uh, discussing how the team will look like and what an optimal um composition would be uh it, it's very evident that uh, that isabella and i uh, will not be able to to do everything alone i think uh, some stuff uh, we will need support and expertise with some stuff will of course also be outsourced um if we talk about back office uh, functions um, but specifically, we're looking um, to bring on board another person to the investment team um, with a background in ideally uh, a biological discipline. So this could be microbiology, could be static biology, um, uh, bioprocess engineering and stuff like that. Uh, who is going to help us um, on the one hand uh, do even faster and, and potentially deeper technical due diligence for our investments, but on the other side also work directly with the portfolio companies. Um, in terms of how they scale their bioprocesses and in terms of how they think through, um, you know, IP and, and, and build up uh, their IP portfolio and strategy around it. Um, and we've uh, just recently, I think uh, yesterday or the day before, we just announced that we're looking for somebody. So this is going to be on a, on a principal level, ideally, um, but we're also happy to accommodate uh, somebody slightly more junior. Nice. So... Uh, shout out to the audience. You heard it here first. Um, if you're looking <laughs> for a job and you have a background in in the area, then uh, let Max know. Um, we are sadly coming up to uh, up to the timing. Um, if nobody has any more questions, I think it's. Um, I, I definitely have a final question uh, to you both, uh, Max and Alina. 
Uh, last year was obviously a year of correction. What is your sort of crystal ball uh, view of the future? Where are we going to be this year? Uh, is it going to get worse or better? Do you want Max, to start? Max, go ahead. Okay. Um, mo most definitely. Um, for us also, we, we, we are not uh, shielded from the, from the current tech correction, shielded from the effects. Uh, although you might argue that uh, since we're investing pre-seed, most of our companies are still seven, eight years away from a, from a plausible exit. Um, however, uh, I, I very much think, um, and this is just my very personal opinion, so <laughs> don't take this as investment advice or anything, um, <laughs> but I think that uh, 2023 is largely going to be a, a sideways move. So I, I don't necessarily think it's going to get significantly worse. I think um, we, we're not yet at the bottom. Um, we'll probably hit that towards the, the first half of the year. But then we'll also slightly see um, investing activity pick back up. And um, most importantly, I think topics that follow a meta-level trend like planetary resilience, planetary health, climate um, are still going to be needed um, on a very like, you know, per definition. And hence, they're not going to go away. And I think the only big problem that I see is that we are now having um, too much venture money chasing too few good teams. And I think that's, uh, for me, something that I worry more about um, than the current macro and, uh, macroeconomic environment. Yeah, maybe just adding one more comment to that, because I'm, I'm very much in line with Max. But one concern, especially in, in, in like a very vibrant scene like climate tech, is definitely where is the money that was raised like throughout the last few years? Where will it will it be deployed? Um, and there's always a risk of diluting such a specialized scene with maybe only semi-good deals because, of course, the money needs to be deployed. And then also it will put, again, a lot of pressure on the funds in the ecosystem. Uh, it will be very competitive. And I think Climate Tech for now was very friendly, very cooperative. Funds learn from each other. So it's, it's very interesting to see uh, how the dynamics might shift there. Um, but I think especially emerging managers, small funds that are still kind of adapting to the market environment uh, have the best chances in, in this current environment. I mean, honestly, one last point, I think um, as a young manager, and, and obviously this is like my, my first correction cycle, I think it's a tremendous learning opportunity, right? And um, so I'm not like in, in, in stasis or shocked uh, that I don't know what I'm going to do with the portfolio, but I'm much rather speaking to more experienced GPs in our network, kind of triangulating how they think about it and how they approach it. And then obviously deriving our own answer um, to this to this current uh, situation. And I see it as a tremendous learning opportunity. Well, finding that answer, I think... Uh definitely needs another session um <laughs> it's been a lot of fun uh max thank you so much for joining us and i hope we can repeat this maybe uh towards like the end of the year or the second half of the year um really talking about some of these lessons how how your portfolio and also how you with your advisors uh, are, are actually helping your your startups to to navigate this crisis right because as you mentioned there's enough capital technically out there Uh, you are lucky that you are investing seed and pre-seed and very, very early. We are seeing that companies continue to get funded, um, especially great companies like in your portfolio. So this makes us all happy. Um, and yeah, but let's see where the year takes us. So um, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Alena, also for uh, moderating, co-hosting with me. Uh, and thank you, everybody who attended today. Um, We'll share the uh, recording on our YouTube channel and our next webinar will be in about a month's time. So look out for the invite. Looking forward to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.